we both, uh, it, we're in the first day of the, of the conference, right. and uh, we've both been a bit distracted by telephone calls from journalists <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, ab ab about the, about the m Mark Mathis <laughs> fiasco. Yes. Um, but uh, I think we both attended Ellen Johnson's yes. opening speech. She's the um, president of the Atheists. Mm -hmm. Is it American Atheists? They're called Atheists. Yes. yes. Uh, and um, what was your impression of her speech? Oh, I thought it was wonderful. I mean, yeah. she's, she's sort of put out a call for you know, more activism. And uh, I think that's what we need. That she was saying, you've got to get off your butts. And you've got to get out and do things. And uh, she was making a very strong point that you know, uh, if you talk about agnostics, atheists, you know, free thinkers in general, it's 11% of the population. We're a pretty significant voting bloc, if, if only we got our act together. Compared, right. for example, to other voting blocs yes. who are taken very seriously indeed exactly. by politicians. And if you look at the United States and, you know, the way she was portraying it is, is we're this hodgepodge of these little groups. They're all, you know, 5 to 15% various groups. Uh, there's, no, there's nobody that's really hugely dominating the landscape. Uh, but there are certain groups that are getting much more media attention and that are respected much more by politicians because the politicians know that those, those little groups will turn out the vote for them or against them. And uh, atheists are not in that group. We're a large group, a very substantial group, but we don't have that kind of unity where they're, they're afraid that we will you know, withhold our vote if, if they don't get their vote. The, those other influential lobbies, it's sometimes I've asked people why this is, because it's always puzzled me. And one of the, the answers I've got is that they tend to be one-issue voters, so that, so that they, mm -hmm. you know, that any, they, they are sort of passionately in favor of Israel or, or, or something of that sort. And so it's very easy for politicians to fall in with their wishes, because their wishes apply to a, a particular issue right. or set of issues. It, could it be that we are too heterogeneous in the issues that we support? I, I don't see why that should be, actually. I mean, I could imagine we have yeah, yeah, well, a fair degree of uniformity over you know, there, 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 there are certain issues where I think we do have unity. Things, things like, you know, keep the Ten Commandments out of the courtrooms and so forth, uh, that we, we would rather not see more secularization, that we'd like to see more money flowing away from the churches and in, in his secular causes. Let's end, let's end this faith-based stuff. And stop the churches having yes. tax... Um, but one thing that Ellen did not talk about, and, and that I think might be a factor too, is that we, are, we tend to be a bit different from all the others, in that we are opposing things, you know, like if, if we want to tax the churches, most of these other groups think that's a horrible idea. So in aggregate, they outnumber us pretty significantly. Because those other groups are churches themselves, you mean? Yes, yes. because they can, they can unite on that issue. Yes. Where even we cannot unite particularly effectively on, no. on that. That's yeah. right, because although we're quite big compared to any one of those other groups, they are united on that, so they all add up together yes. on that yes. issue. Right. But uh, I think it's also just a factor that um, atheists tend not to be joiners. We don't, we don't form these clubs very readily. And even if we do form these clubs, they, they tend to be rather fractious affairs where we argue a lot. Mm -hmm. we, we put value on skepticism and mm -hmm. doubt and argument, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, it's not the kind of thing to foster a strong community, a unified community. Yes. I'm not sure that religious people don't argue quite a lot as well. I mean, it's various, I mean, particularly with those yes. denominations that are right close to them. Um, right. But at least within their denomination, they can, they can close ranks pretty quickly yes. against the outsider. Yeah. And they have a kind of hierarchy of authority, yes. which is, I mean, authority is pretty much anathema to, to atheists. Yeah. Hey, you, know, you, you notice this in your talk, too, that right after your talk, people came up and they argued with you. Yes, sure. Yeah. Which is great. Yes. You yes. Know, even if you disagree with them or if you agree with them, mm. uh, what, what happened after your talk was that there was, there was uh, dissent and debate, and, and that's... That's what we and that's do. very stimulating. Yes. That's what yes. we want, yes. Yeah, and I, I noticed too that you conceded a few points, which mm. is also what we, what we do is, you know, we're, we're willing to argue about these things and we're also willing to back down and say, okay. You listen to the arguments yes. and you back down. Yes. Yes, you've given me a better idea. Yeah. I think that's a better idea. I will follow that idea. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah it's I, quite hard to imagine a Catholic bishop or something <laughs> doing that. Well, yeah, because you can't argue with God. He's given you the answer, right? Yes, yeah, with the Pope, anyway. Yeah. One of the fashionable jargon words in, in our field at the moment is 
Evo Devo, uh -huh. uh, evolution and development. What, what does it mean to you? Uh, well, it's a funny word for one thing. <laughs> yeah. But um, what, it, what it means is that we were trying to bring developmental biology into the mainstream of evolutionary biology. That uh, we have a long tradition where uh, development has been kind of left out of most of the formulations of evolutionary theory. Uh, and, and that goes right back to the neo-Darwinian synth synthesis. You know, Richard Goldschmidt was was our proponent, proponent at that point, and uh, a lot of what he suggested wasn't quite right and antagonized a lot of people, although there was, I think there was a lot of worth to what Goldschmidt was actually saying. Uh, and since then, uh, developmental biologists and evolutionary biologists didn't relate much until roughly the 1980s. Uh, when uh, Christiana Nusslein Volhard and Eric Wieschaus did all their groundbreaking work on uh, molecular biology of the developing Drosophila embryo and just, just broke the field wide open because now all of a sudden we had the molecules, we had the tools, we had the genetic tools uh, to do comparative work in lots and lots of different developing systems. We could look at the developmental processes that are going on in nematodes and fruit flies and zebrafish and mice and people and all these kinds of good things. Um, and, and obviously at that point we had to bring evolutionary theory right there into the middle of developmental biology. It was crucial to make that a part of it. And, and since then it's just grown stronger and stronger. That it's, it's become a, a hugely powerful, hugely powerful uh, discipline within biology where we're learning all kinds of new things where we're explicitly comparing developmental processes in many different organisms and trying to figure out how those are related through evolutionary events. So that's Evo Devo in a nutshell. Mm. Goldschmidt, indeed, I mean, could be said to be the father of, of that, but he, he also is known for championing macromutational steps in yes. evolution. Uh, and I think a lot of the hostility to Goldschmidt comes from that, right. uh, would, would you wish to defend that? Leaps in a single generation? No way. No. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of, the thing is, a lot of what Goldschmidt was saying was really interesting phenomena that we, we kind of neglected, that we kind of swept under the rug for a long time. You know, what Goldschmidt studied were, uh, first of all, he's, he's studying Lymantria, the moth, and he's looking at metamorphosis. And he's saying, okay, well, you've got caterpillars and you've got these moths. They're very different morphologies, yet obviously it's the same genetics, the same genome in all of those. He's looking at, uh, at uh, male and female. And again, differences between these, but they've got basically the same genes. Uh, and he was also looking at phenocopies, where you can have environmental effects that induce uh, phenomena that look very much like genetic changes. So you can, you can mimic genetic changes with, with the environment. And he, he was arguing that there have, has to be uh, large-scale regulatory elements that can switch the genome into one mode or another mode. And from that perspective, hopeful monsters start mm -hmm. to look a little more promising. Well, it's just a, it's just a mode mm. switch, you know, mm. like the switch mm. between male and female. Which Waddington took up in a big way later. Yes, yes. yes. But of course, since what we've discovered, it's, it's, it's much more complicated than that. It's not... He, you know, he talked about global systemic macro mutations, and, and we really don't see those. What we see is, is lots and lots of little switches all over the place. Yes. Where again, we're, we're back in, in the field of conventional Darwinian theory, where we're looking at gradual changes by making small changes in, in lots of places yeah. over time. Yeah. Uh, and, and you really can't call that no. hopeful monsters anymore. But, but the general principle is the same, that, that switches are important, okay? Little switches that will change things instead of big switches. Uh, and, and the, the phenomena he was describing, like metamorphosis, like sex differences, they're still there. They've got to be explained. Yes. We've, got to, we've got to understand what's going on in the genome to uh, reconfigure itself, basically, into these modes over life histories. Yes. And how we did that in evolution. Um, when, a, when a caterpillar metamorphoses into a, into a butterfly, um, it, it more or less turns itself into soup inside yes. and then starts again. Uh, so it's not, it, it, it's not a macromutational state. You don't have to talk about a macromutational state. No. Uh, you, can, you can, but I mean, there is still a sort of bit of a problem in explaining how the, uh, I, I suppose ancestrally, the, it must have been a much more smooth affair 